Okay, let's continue talking about these neurons. And one of the most important things that we need to understand about neurons is that the axons can be myelinated or unmyelinated. So what is myelin? Well, it is actually a insulating sheath made up of a specific type of neuroglial cell called a Schwann cell. And what it it, what it actually does for the axon is it speeds up the ability to send the action potential. So we'll be explaining about exactly how that happens a little bit later, but right now let's just look at myelin. Currently we're looking at a neuron. Again, there's the nerve cell body, the soma, and you can see the you know organelles and the parts of the cytoplasm in the picture. Here's the dendritic areas, the areas that are actually receiving information. And of course, the, we call it the receptive areas. And the nerve cell body can also receive information. But here's the axon hillock, the beginning of the axon. And then here's the axon. And so far, this is not myelinated. But so when we send a signal, the action potential literally has to travel across every portion of the axon which it takes a while i mean it's still super fast but in relative time it takes a slower amount of time for the action potential to travel the whole length of an unmyelinated axon so we tend to see shorter axons as being unmyelinated and long axons where we need to speed the signal up we see them myelinated okay so what do we, again, what do we mean by myelination? Well, let's look at an example. Okay, again, myelin comes from cells called Schwann cells. And what, what happens is Schwann cells wrap around segments of the axon with a little bit of space between each Schwann cell. And they literally squeeze out their cytoplasm. So basically what's left is that cell membrane. And what that does, that provides a really good insulating material. So watch this little part of the video where they're going to choose a section here that a Schwann cell is going to myelinate. As a Schwann cell wraps around and around the axon in the process of myelination, its cytoplasm is squeezed out. The tightly wound cell membrane becomes the actual insulation. To see the process of myelination again, click the Schwann cell. Okay, so we see again, we see the Schwann cell wrapping around sections of the axon, keeping in mind that there's always going to be some areas that's not wrapped by the myelin, by the Schwann cell that becomes the myelin. And, and keep in mind, what's actually sending the signal is the ability of sodium to rush into the cell and potassium to leave the cell. So sodium can enter the cell and leave the membrane of the cell, of the axon, in this section, but sodium would not be able to enter or potassium leave or sodium potassium pumps kick in and, you know, uh, uh, you know, restore the original conditions, that would not be able to happen in this area. So any sodium that rushed in would actually have to flow internally past this area to the next area, the nodal area, which is called a neurofibril node, also called a node of Ranvier. Okay, so again, what this myelin sheath is doing is preventing any ions from coming in or any ions from going out in the section where that occurs. So here again, we see the actual myelin sheath, the Schwann cell that became the myelin sheath. Now, ultimately, notice I've got the myelin sheath here, 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 here. But what I also have is I have these little areas without myelin sheath, and those are called the nodes of Ranvier. They're little gaps where sodium can rush in and potassium can rush out just in these areas, not in the myelinated areas. Therefore, instead of the signal having to travel the whole distance and sodium rush in and potassium rush out among every portion of the axon it only has to do it at the nodes so that greatly we call that saltatory conduction it greatly speeds up the ability of the signal to pass so again i see my node of ronvier here node of ronvier here all the gaps 
and that's literally where the signal, which always starts at the axon hillock, that's literally where it's generated because the sodium that runs in here actually runs underneath this myelin sheath till it gets to the next segment, triggering an opening of gates where sodium can then rush in here, flow internally past this myelin sheath to the next area where it triggers the opening of doorways, little uh, sodium gates that open up, sodium rushes in. Of course, after the sodium rushes in, and, and and runs in and depolarizes the area and runs past, then the potassium rushes out, repolarizing the area. So we've always got this depolarization, repolarization, which is technically what our definition of an action potential is, depolarization followed by repolarization. But again, back to our subject, what is myelin doing? It's speeding up that signal. It's speeding up that signal by having us only have to do these at these at these nodal areas instead of at the whole length of the of the axon that is myelinated because this is insulating it. Okay, so we're going to watch a little part of the video clip where the action potential is conducted. Note it's it's only conducted beginning at the axon hillock and only at the nodes, but it is it extre it's extremely it's it's extremely fast and much faster than if we had to send the signal along the whole axon without the myelin sheath insulating it. Along a myelinated axon. Again, notice how the signal was only at the areas where the sodium and was able to go in and potassium was able to go out. But again, once the sodium went in here, it then flowed past this area to the next area where it triggered a depolarization and an opening up of what's called voltage-gated channels for sodium in the next section. We'll be talking more about that and the, the physiology, the mechanics of it a little bit later. Right now, the key is to understand myelinated um, axons create a faster signal. That's called saltatory conduction. Now, the other notable thing about this is when we talk about gray matter and white matter, white matter is white matter purely because it is myelinated axons so if you ever see white matter whether that's in the tracks in the brain or whether that's in the you know the outside of the spinal cord uh, then what you're seeing is myelinated axons where you have gray matter you don't have myelinated axons you have the nerve cell bodies you may have axons synapsing that are not myelinated on their dendrites or on the nerve cell body but gray matter is non-myelinated areas of the neurons. Okay, now let's, let's continue and talk about what's happening with what is it that the neurotransmitters are doing. Here we see acetylcholine, same neurotransmitter we talked about in the neuromuscular junction. But here we see something called GABA. And of course, there are many different neurotransmitters. We will be mentioning some of them, obviously not all of them. But... Notice then, here's my phospholipid membrane, here's a doorway, here's a doorway, and what we would call these, we would call these chemically gated channels, and the chemical is going to be the neurotransmitter, and so I like to call the chemically gated channels doorways, and I call these keyed doorways because I have to have a key to cause the doorway to open up, and so my neurotransmitter is the key, but what's going through the channel, either inside or outside of the cell, is going to be then my ions. So looking at our key here, we see, you know, we can never get away from talking about sodium and potassium because we know that, you know, in the body we have more sodium outside of cells, so it's usually wanting to try to get in. We have more potassium in the majority of our cells, more potassium inside, so it's usually trying to get out. And then, of course, we have, you know, if we got sodium out here, we definitely have to have a lot of chloride because they came in together as sodium chloride. But once they're ionized inside, they can do separate activities. And then, of course, in the cell, one thing that we have is a lot of anions, particularly our proteins that have negative charges on them. Okay, here we have what looks like a leak channel. And this is potentially being represented as what's called a gated channel. So a leak channel is a channel that would always be open. So again, if something passes through it, it's simply due to usually because of diffusion going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. If these blue little beads here represent 
represent potassium, which we know we have more potassium inside of cells, and I have a potassium leak channel, then they are typically going to leak out of the cell. I'm not saying it's impossible for them to leak in, but they always go in a net movement from a higher concentration to a lesser concentration. All right, th if this is a sodium channel and these are sodium ions out here, notice I've got more sodium ions out here than sodium in here. So they're typically going to want to go inside that. But this may be a different type of channel because there are different types of channels. There are channels that open up due to voltage changes. We call those voltage gated channels. There are channels that open up due to like chemicals attaching to them, like neurotransmitters. We call those chemically gated channels. And there are even channels that we're not going to talk a lot about this semester, but I just want to mention them. They're called mechanically gated channels. In other words, some sort of mechanical, you know, something presses up against this, changes its shape, and allows ions to go in. That, that often works in injuries in the body that then maybe stimulates a pain receptor or something like that. Okay, but let's go ahead and just talk about in general that what's going on in these in these uh, neurons, looking at these ion channels. And again, it's the channels and the movement of ions that actually make something excitable, makes it able to do something. Because every cell, remember, has a phospholipid membrane with proteins embedded in it. And every cell has sodium and potassium, but not every cell has the same number of sodium and potassium channels. So cells with more channels tend to be more excitable. Channels control the movement of ions across the neural membrane. These tiny anatomical structures make neurons excitable. Okay, so again, you can see the movement of ions back across this. If this is a gated channel, it happens, let's say a voltage has opened it up. Uh, usually we call the voltage it takes to open up a channel, like a voltage gated channel, we call that threshold. That's a real important uh, terminology we'll be talking more about. Okay, our goal for this is to understand what the ion channels are, to understand where they are located, because where they're located is really important to understand what can happen and to understand what triggers them to, what causes them to function, what triggers them to open or shut, or do they always stay open? Now, we need to understand, well, what do we find in a typical cell membrane? So that's one reason why I spend so much time early on going over the cell parts, particularly the membrane, saying, yeah, we got this phospholipid bilayer and we've got these proteins embedded in it. What are these proteins doing? Because what the proteins are doing usually defines what's happening physiologically. Okay, and then, Notice that something that we also tried to establish is the fact that that is negative compared to the outside. Okay. Okay, what we're what we're needing to understand is where do we typically have our ions distributed? Because even though this inside of the cell is trying to stay neutrally charged. Across the membrane, there's almost always a difference in the charge, and that creates what we call a membrane potential. And since I have so many sodium, so much sodium on the outside of that membrane, then it, we tend to have a positive charge on the outside of the membrane, and then a, compared to a negatively charged on the inside, because even though we have potassium, which is also positively charged, we've got all these all these anions, usually all these proteins that are too big to be able to get out. So they tend to uh, allow a negative charge to form on the inside of this membrane. And so then when we have the ions flowing back and forth, that may change that charge. But the leak channels tend to keep a, a certain charge going on when other channels aren't really active. And we call that a resting membrane potential. They maintain a certain charge difference between what's going on outside and what's going on inside. And since different cells have different numbers of these leak channels, then different types of cells will have different resting membrane potentials.